where did the idea for St. Bernard come from? Um, I wanted to make uh, a film that kind of uh, focused on things that my fascinations, I guess, um, art, uh, surrealism, brain disorders. And if I'm going to make my own film something I have fun with the subject matter, that as I start to uh, get deep into it, I have a good time being surrounded by those themes. So I, I, music is part of that. So coming up with a musical conductor spiraling into the abyss of madness, I thought was a perfect canvas to play to my strengths as an effects artist and maybe um, telling a surreal story, which I enjoy. Uh, so th that narrative of him becoming mentally unhinged seemed like a great place to start to tell the kind of storytelling I wanted. And when you're when you're creating a story and and putting together the visual aspects you want of it and the narrative aspects that you want you want of it, how do you how do you cohesively build that foundation to start shooting on, or do you just kind of go go with the flow as you're doing it? Um, no, I, I I it had to be very planned out because a lot of the scenarios. Uh, were ambitious and specific, and I needed to have the team supporting me, knowing where we were going with it, and prepped for it. Um, the the picking out the scenarios that are going to happen were were really the challenge I set up for myself: is how can I how can I visualize mental instability? without just cutting to a doctor with a clipboard saying, that guy Bernard's going crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so to kind of, you know, celebrate the medium of film, film is, is its own language and, and can cast some really cool spells over the viewing audience. So I, I wanted to explore that. And um, I thought film would be the perfect way to try and visualize what a mental disintegration looks like. That's how the scenarios all came about of showing some of it's quite literal that the St. Bernard dog head he carries with disintegrates as it probably would in real life, but it's also a metaphor for his disintegrating mental state. Also his tuxedo starts out pristine by the end of the film is in tatters. All of these could be metaphors for his, his mental stability. Um, I'm a big fan of dream logic. I love the way our brains create dreams or, or even our daydreams when we're driving along for me sometimes my thoughts bounce around and I end up on a topic and I kind of laugh and I go how did I get there in like a minute and then I retrace the steps and I really pay attention to that and I go okay wouldn't it be cool to make a film that jumps around with that kind of logic and I bet it will connect with an audience because we all do it our brain is actually ricocheting all over the place and filtering and putting it in order. If if I could put these scenes together that fit within the context of the film, like a dream logic, that might be a really exciting way to communicate the story to the public. Uh, what, sort, what sort of research, if any, did you do into mental illness and uh, the meaning of dreams before you started shooting this film? Um, Mental illness, my, both my parents are doctors. So when I grew up, there was always anatomy books around, textbooks, reference books. And whenever reading stuff about mental disorders or I'd see people on the street, you know, screaming at a lampshade, you know, and inquired or read about it, the mental issues of mental disorder were pretty scary because some of them people are born with, some lay dormant and then reveal themselves later on uh, some ex, you know explode with with getting old you know different forms of Alzheimer's and um, dementia so and right to whatever those illnesses that person let's say has on the street as well that person on the street if you're at a red light and you're looking at a, a guy screaming at nothing in his mind that's completely real to him it's a hallucination that he's fully in. And um, 
you know, as sad as tra- and tragic as all that is, that's super fascinating to me to take that imagery in those scenarios, and those are direct implants into what Bernard is experiencing. And I don't know where it is about halfway through the film, I think the viewing audience begins to understand that these forces aren't coming at him. These are manifestations of his brain coming out of him. And um, uh, in reference to dreams, I, I've always loved dreams. I love the absurdism of them, the way they nonsensically swirl together in the brain. And I, and I think it's the connective tissue of the dreams that work when you're asleep that's so fascinating to me. In a dream, you don't question these weird scenes one after another after another. It's just you, you go with the flow and react to it. However, it's only when the dream is over you might look back on it and laugh and go, boy, that was really absurd. I love that. And that's th- there you could almost see the blueprint for the style of storytelling I was trying to do with St. Bernard. During the film, I... I worked very hard that during the film, all the scenes, even as extreme as they may be, work together and point at one another or subliminally linked or motivate the story forward. But when the movie's over and the lights come up, you might go, what the heck was that? Um, I love that, that that may have a parallel to, to dream to the dream world. Uh, as far as, as the film stock you decided to shoot on, was there a specific uh, reason for picking that uh, aesthetically, or was that just your preferred method of, of shooting, or, or what? Um, I shot uh, a short film in 95 on AGFA uh, film stock, and that was 16 millimeter, and it was beautiful. Um, and then I did some tests with Kodak, and I found that I was preferring the Kodak stock more and by the time we got to St. Bernard, the digital revolution was in full swing. The good part of that was that the film companies had to really kind of pull out of their secret drawers all their secret sauce and their film stocks, and film stocks just exploded in beauty. They got better, tighter. There's a film stock called 7219 that we were shooting that practically sees in the dark, which was just unheard of even eight to ten years before it. And um, I've always loved the emulsion of film, and I don't even want to say grain anymore because the films have gotten so good. It's not like what we remember from the 70s and early 80s where there is a grain or a texture which which can be a little distracting. It's it's so beautiful now, um, and the film is so fast and capable of shooting in low light <clears throat> that if you choose to shoot film like I do, it's uh, it's wonderful. I think it, and for me, the strange type of storytelling I'm doing, the part of the message is in the medium. Like if it was shot video and wasn't produced properly, the surreal storytelling might seem like it was um, not, pre-arranged, even if it's an ambitious scene. I think you lose something in that. With film, I think subconsciously people realize, oh, there's always eight to ten people standing around if you're going to run film through the camera. And it also seems to raise the awareness for everyone that, okay, we're spending real money here. We're not just rolling tape and rolling and rolling. We're running film through this, go through a lab, processing and color timing. So it it kind of elevates all the senses, and it's, um, uh, I think, a wonderful way to almost make the film even stranger when you see, when you see the commitment to it, that it is being committed to film. I think it, it helps uh, push forward the overall uh, strangeness of the film. There's something, there's something about film that's slightly more tangible. It doesn't feel like a, a product. It feels more like art when it's actual film. Uh, for me, yeah. as come, speaking as a longtime cinema fan, it's just there's there's just something just slightly different about it where you're like this this is really art. This isn't just something that was just made by committee and shot by you know just a crew just for a job. It just feels better overall. <laughs> I agree, and I think the key word you said is feel that. 
there's actually the tactile handling of the film. And, you know, there's that saying, like, chefs never cook if they're pissed off, if, if someone's having an argument with their wife or in the back of a restaurant. They feel that it actually their energy goes into the food and they would be doing a disservice of serving this neg negative vibe induced food. I actually think it's probably the same with film. You're handling a negative, you're loading it in, all the energy there on set, including the location. I think all that stuff, if there is an energy to everything, it maybe gets inside of that. And then it's handled again in the lab. And then it, there, when they say lightning can be captured in a bottle, I don't, I don't think they thought that saying through, that it's absolutely true. The, the vibrations, the energy, the mood of the day, it is transmitted. I mean, you could, you, we've all walked into a room after someone's had an argument, and you don't hear yelling, and you don't know it, but you feel a vibe. So moods and, and stuff have tangible reflections that, you know, maybe this will be proven in a couple hundred years as we figure out more science. But I think what you're saying with the feel is, is absolutely right. I, I think it actually becomes a physical manifestation that somehow maybe comes through when a person watches a film. I mean, it gets very technically digitally removed once the film is processed to a disc or shown in a film theater, but maybe there's something in that emulsion that, that fights its way through that the public picks up on and appreciates. And, and also part of, uh, of getting that, that feeling is also with the actors. And I noticed you had a number of very uh, aesthetically interesting actors in your film. How did you go about casting these people? Uh, some are from past relationships. The star of the film, Jay Dugray, um, I worked with on Skin Deep and loved his range of acting, got along with him well. He kind of understood the type of storytelling I was up for and um, was able to really perform well even when the physical situations got really difficult. He had a lot of climbing, a lot of weather elements to deal with. He was great with that. Um, Warwick Davis is in this as a character called Othello. Uh, I worked with him on Skin Deep as well and have a history of knowing him through doing the makeup on him for the Leprechaun film series. Uh, getting to know him personally, I knew he had a wonderful sense of humor uh, that even goes into the absurd, and um, which I think the, the public knows now since his wonderful show last year, Life's Too Short, showed. I, I was so happy that everyone else could know what a great sense of humor he has. And um, then there's Katie Sullivan, who plays Miss Roadkill. Katie is a double amputee. I knew her from a past project and knew I had this extremely graphic scene in the film with the, with the truck driver. And um, uh, you saw the film, right? Yes, I, I watched okay. it yesterday morning. Okay, so you know the scene probably I'm talking about. So mm -hmm. I wanted to, to do a no-apology, completely gruesome sequence and uh, discussed it with Katie to see how she would feel about being – you know, the focal point of the subject matter. And she was all up for it. Katie was born without legs. She has a wonderful sense of humor. And when she understood the entire scene, how I don't really want to bum people out. Well, I do initially until what happens at the end where the mood of it turns around. She totally got it and thought it was hilarious. And the other truck driver involved, he did lose his legs in a violent accident many years ago but was long past the trauma and really appreciated my being up, fr up front about how I was going to approach the scene, how graphic it's going to be, how gruff and um, inappropriate his character is going to be. And he was fine with it. Once he understood where it's coming from, how the scene wraps up, and how actually in a weird way she becomes empowered, uh, they both thought it was great. And... Um, it was it was really important to lay that out because there was no hiding what we were doing. And um, uh, once they got in, they were fully on board. They 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 just went with it. And um, even as the scene took its its you know dark turns. So the key is to to treat people like treat treat people like like people, not like set dressing. Absolutely, especially <laughs> something like this where uh, there's nothing subtle about it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when you when you completed the film and you look back at it, was there anything about it that you wish you had changed or had uh, done differently? Um, I mean, I think there's always room for improvements in 
every single thing we do from our last conversation to our last piece of art. But uh, I try and I, I, I try to take my time with the films. You know, uh, they are independently made, so there's always a sense of modesty that's going to be baked into it. And my goal is to try and overcome that with the creativity that I could instill in it. And um, you know, I, I think there's room for improvement in all sorts of stuff, but I definitely try not to get bogged down on it. Um, I've seen people really cripple their own advancement in anything in, in athleticism, literary, arts, because they mull over, they mull over, they mull over. There, there's always room for improvement, but if you never wrap it up and move on, you're never going to have the chance to stamp something as done and progress to the next thing. And um, I'm I'm excited about the growth I've had as a filmmaker between Skin Deep and St. Bernard. And uh, I, I wouldn't have stepped away from St. Bernard if I didn't think it was done. And the idea is if, if something does rise to the surface that I wish there was room for improvement or I think about it later as I grow, the nice thing is hopefully you move on to another project and you could put it into that. that that's probably the best way to to be critical of oneself, I think, while while keeping a momentum that's true true to yourself as well. I think uh, I think it was Bob Ross that said, if you are ever completely satisfied with a painting, then you may as well hang up your brushes because you're you're just done as as an artist. There's nothing nothing else to do. <laughs> yeah, you're probably not being honestly critical of your stuff, and um, you know, I, there there's extremes to all of that where. Uh, if a if a person just uses those as marching orders and puts out something that's subpar, they're not going to do any justice to themselves. Uh, so you really have to push to get it as right as you can. But at the same time, you you're going to catch some bumps and warts somewhere along the line. Uh, but at a certain point, it it is to let let it be its thing and hopefully it's it's a, a proud statement <laughs> and then you move on and like I said you know you a person grows a person could step away from something and it's done and only you know it's literally like they say with a painting you, you have tunnel vision on it then you step back and you look at it step back could also come from uh, growing a little and time goes by and then you look back and you go oh, I wish I did that or why did I do that or well that was the best we could do um, the important thing is to hang on to that and try and get that better the next time you go into something. So uh, I think, right? You agree with that? Oh yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. I mean, I've uh, I've been in this business for a long time, and I go back and I read uh, articles I've written, or reviews I've written, or even interviews I've conducted. And I think there's <laughs> there's so much I would change, and then I try to get better each time. I and Sometimes you get feedback that's not that's not the best, but sometimes you get feedback that's very honest. It might hurt your feelings a little bit, but I'd rather have someone say that I totally sucked at something mm -hmm. to know that I'm just not doing it right to appeal to what I need to appeal to. Then that's an audience. Yeah, exactly. And you could one one should make that distinction of if if your craft is bad. That's one thing, and one should grow on it. But if it's not for someone's taste, that shouldn't be offending to you. You know, if you're writing, you personally are writing a very dark style or nasty style, you're almost drawing a line in the sand to say, mm -hmm. I'm not worried about that crowd not liking my stuff. But if there is a crowd that you do want to attract and they feel that then the writing is not good, that's the stuff to listen to. So one, it's worth to make those distinctions within those circles as well. Uh, my, my final question, which is ultimately the most important question, is when and where can people see St. Bernard? Uh, St. Bernard has its distribution deal through Severin Films. Um, and that's run by David Gregory. It's a great label. Uh, I've enjoyed them for many years because they have two of my favorite films, Santa Sangre and Psychomania. And uh, <laughs> so I was really excited when uh, we decided to work together. Um, St. Bernard, uh, 
comes out on Blu-ray, DVD, and video on demand platforms uh, May 14th. So from the time of this interview, uh, exactly almost a week, less than a week away. So and there have been there are screenings happening around. There was just one in Philadelphia. There's one brewing in Toronto. Uh, those are happening as we find venues and as requests come in. So, uh, but for those eager to see it, 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 it's less than a week away at this point. And there's um, uh, other things. They're selling t-shirts and posters and patches and badges, all sorts of fun stuff that if a person likes St. Bernard and wants to de declare their beloved taste to the public, there are ways to wave the flag for <laughs> others to see. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I would definitely go for some uh, skydiving uh, rotisserie chickens. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's, uh, people will instantly know what you're talking about when you show an image of that. 